begin with, remember we did our simulation where you were fighting for control of France, right? So now we're going to find out who really got control of France. I always like to save this for after the simulation so some of you don't think like, well, I deserve it because I really did take over. So let's find out who's in charge of France. That give you a clue? The radicals are the first group in charge of France. Notice I said first group, right? Because there will be more than one. Um, now understand that these notes at this point, the king and queen have been arrested. They are in prison. But remember that they're in prison for four years. So it will be a while before the king and queen die. But at this point, the revolution is in full swing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Okay, so there is widespread fear across France. The king and queen are in prison. There's violence, killing everywhere, groups fighting all over the place. Now, part of the reason that there's fear is not only do we have these rebels attacking, but the rebels believe that the nobles, all your rich, powerful people, are going to unite and plot to overthrow the rebels. So they decide they're going to kill every noble. Where are my noble people? Where's my noble group in here? Yes, I'm sorry to say, guys, but you die at this point. Basically, all of you, believe it or not. They did. They killed them all. And they were called the September Massacres. You'll notice that they didn't just kill men. They killed children. They killed women. They killed anybody that looked rich. That was basically the definition. Um, if you remember in the movie Marie Antoinette, Remember that night where all of her friends and family escape in the middle of the night? That's the night that they get caught. It's during September. And uh, they get caught and all of them get killed. So even if the king and queen had tried to escape the country that night, they would have been caught and killed then too. Okay, so that's part of the September massacres. Now they basically defined who was killed and who wasn't by the clothing that they wore. They called it sans culotte. San means without, kulat means breeches, okay? Um, here, I'll show you the picture. It makes more sense. If you look at this picture, people who were nobles wore these breeches. It's like little capris that have a button just down below the knee, and that was a sign of wealth because only they could afford those kind of pants. Well, poor people couldn't afford that. They wore whatever they could get their hands on for pants. So this was a sign of wealth, so anybody that wore those would be killed. So, like, what's the most expensive pair of jeans you could buy today? Revival. Rock revivals. So imagine anybody wearing rock revivals would be killed right now because you would be assumed to be rich, right? However, the problem with that, and back then this was a problem, is I might go to a thrift shop and find a really cool pair of rock revivals. So I'm sporting those rock revivals, thinking I'm all cool, and I'm as poor as a church mouse but I would get killed too because I'm wearing those expensive clothes. So even poor people that wore those breeches got killed because it was a sign of wealth. So they're killing everybody who's wealthy. They then decided what to do with the government. And so they created a national convention, which is like the first Congress. And they met in 1792 and they did three things. The first vote, they said, no more monarchy, no more king or queen, they're gone. The second thing they did is they established France as a republic. And if you look at the definition of a republic, it is a political system in which the power rests in the people electing representatives for their beliefs. I was going to say, are we a republic in the United States? We are. In fact, look at this. Every day you say it. And to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God. Yeah, we are a republic. So they were trying to just get that elected representative thing going. The third thing they had to decide was they had a king and queen sitting in prison for four years. And they had to decide what to do with them. Um, and this, this assembly, this Congress, was split almost right down the middle with two groups in power. Yes. Yes. Remember, we were done by 1776. See my nice flag back there? That was our independence. And then this is like 1780s into 1790s. Yeah, pretty much. 
Yeah, they got their ideas from us. You bet. Uh, Republic, yes. Okay, so let's see what happened with the vote on the king and queen. We had one group called the Jacobins and the other called the Girondins. Need those for your test, but these are nicknames for groups that you know about. The Jacobins were the radicals. Where's my radical party? This is you, so you would be known as the Jacobins, okay? The Girondins were also known as the moderates. Where's my moderate party? That's your group, okay. So like I said, they were really split, about half and half in this group. Of course, the Jacobins or the, the radicals, they wanna kill the king, right? We knew that when we did our game. The Girondins wanted to spare the king. That was how they put it. So they wanted to either put him in prison or exile them, meaning you get kicked out of the country forever and you can never come back. Well, it was a very, very close vote, came down to like one or two votes. But in the end, the radicals had more control. So the radicals take control of France. And as you know, they end up killing the king and queen. If you look at this painting, you'll see, uh, first of all, they use the guillotine because it's more humane. We've mentioned that before. Um, unfortunately, this guillotine had been used quite a bit. And I don't think that they had sharpened the blade beforehand because as the blade went through his neck, he cried out, which is a sign that he felt it. And that's not a good sign. So it probably means that it was not a fun way to die. Let's just say that. Um, now you'll notice that they held this head out to the crowd and his blood and guts coming out of his neck there and everything, right? You're not gonna pass out on me, are you? Okay. <laughs> But what's really gross is the women would take their hankies and dip it in his blood because they wanted to show that they had helped kill this tyrant. Because remember, you guys were losing your children. I mean, your children were starving to death because of these people. So they were really angry. They wanted every part of that killing. Now this is testimony from a guy who was there the moment he died, and that was the Catholic priest. And I noticed some of the things he said were rather interesting. So you're gonna wanna highlight those or whatever, okay? It said, the path leading to the scaffold was extremely rough and difficult to pass. So he's leading the king up. Why is it rough and difficult to pass? Well, that might be, he might be somewhat weak, but what's he having a hard time getting through, Macy? The people, yeah. They're throwing stuff at him. They're hitting him. They're scratching him as he goes through. And he can hardly get through. So that's what he means by rough and difficult to pass. Then he said, the king was obliged to lean on him. And from the slowness with which he proceeded, I feared for a moment that his courage might fail. You have to understand that for a person to walk to their death, especially in a guillotine, people sometimes passed out and they had to like carry them to their death. Some people would actually pee their pants or poop their pants. They were so scared. So he's worried this guy is gonna freak out and they're gonna have to carry him up there, which is a very dishonorable way for a king to act. But then he says, oh, but what was my astonishment when arrived at the last step, he let go of my arm and he basically walked up there proudly to the end by himself. Yep, he's like, come on, let's get it going here. Yep, you got it. He then addressed the crowd, and in a loud voice, he heard him pr proudly pronounce these words. Number one, I die innocent of all the crimes laid to my charge. Remember, he was charged with treason. He said, I am not a treasonous person. Number two, I pardon those who had occasioned my death. It means I forgive you for killing me. Can you imagine killing somebody who's gonna cut your head off? That'd be tough, wouldn't it? I don't know if I'd be that understanding. And the third thing that's really weird is he predicted what was to come in. He said, I pray to God that the blood you are going to shed today may never be visited on France. His hope was that today, his last death would be the end of the death. But he said, I hope you're not gonna do this to our people here. I hope you're not gonna kill all these people in France. He knew it was coming. And unfortunately he was right because they're gonna kill thousands of people before this is over. So he kind of saw the future a little bit. 
Now, I want you to imagine you are one of the members of that Congress. If you were in that Congress, what would you have voted for? Would you have wanted him killed? Would you have wanted her killed? Same uh, punishment or not? Uh, would you have exiled them, kicked them out of the country? Would you have kept them in prison? Take into consideration the basic crime. Like, you might have lost family members because they starved to death. So think about that. Also take into consideration how you feel about the death penalty. Do you think it's okay to execute somebody for their crimes? All right? So imagine you are a member of that Congress. What would you vote and why? Write it down, and then we're going to have you share. Yeah, write it to your All right. People with boots on, stand on up, stand on up. Come on, stand up. Let's hear what you have to say. All right. So, Jesslyn, what would you do? Um, well, I don't think that we should have killed him. Okay. I don't like the death penalty. You're against the death penalty. So, would you have kept them in prison? Would you have kicked them out of the country? Um, probably kept them in prison. Kept them in prison. Okay. Any particular reason? Um, just because, like, I guess that's. I feel like that's more harmful than the death penalty. Sure because they have to think about their crime like the whole time they're in there. All right, thank you, have a seat. What would you do, Taylor? Okay, because? All right, sounds fair to me. Okay, what would you do? Kick them out, exile? All right, is it because you're against the death penalty or you don't think you deserved it? Or? Okay, thank you. Excellent. Randa? It wasn't like they took a gun to somebody. People died of starvation, but maybe their lack of knowledge. Okay, all right. Okay. The They were oblivious, weren't they? Okay, punishment doesn't fit the crime. Awesome, what do you think? What would you do? Okay. Okay, so you keep them in prison. Excellent, what would you do? Okay. So they could have achieved the same goal by just getting rid of him. Okay, good. Kessler, what would you do? Keep him in prison for the same reason. Okay, all right. Okay, excellent. Take them out of the country. Boy, we had the ladies representing today, didn't we? Now, did we have anybody that said I would kill them? Okay, I got to hear that voice here. All right, why would you kill him, Daytona? I would kill him because if I had my children die, I would be very upset and demand justice. Okay, yeah, imagine the anger you would have if your children died. Okay, good. Wills? I said they should kill Marie, but not the king and children, because the king was at war and he was doing other important things, and Marie wasn't really doing anything except tending to her garden and attending plays. So I feel like she should have stepped in, maybe, and not spent so much on children and killed him. Interesting. Yeah, that's so you would have killed her, but not him. Scared of, like, they could have exiled. They could have been um, kicked out of the country. Okay. But I think Marie probably should have done more than that, so. Excellent, thank you. Right? Yeah, question? Well, he definitely had the final stamp on everything because it's all about the king in France. Um, but there's no doubt she was spending a lot of money. That's true. But a lot of it was going to the American Revolution, too. So, yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about that. 
One of the biggest arguments against exile is because he could build an army and then try to invade and overthrow the government. Same argument with the prison. You know, he could break out of prison, create an army, and then come back and invade. So that was part of the reason the radicals said we want him dead. We don't want any chance this guy is going to come back. Yeah, good. They did, but it just took them a while. They're going to show up, but it's going to be after the king and queen are dead, believe it or not. Well, remember, they don't have airplanes and all the fun stuff we do today. Plus, it took them a while to organize and agree, okay, yes, we're coming. And I know it, it seems like forever, though, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. They were four years. It shouldn't take them four years to get there, should it? Honestly, I really think they thought that maybe things were going to work out because they were sitting in prison. So they thought, well, maybe they're going to let them go. Maybe they'll put them back in power. You know, I think they were trying to let it work out. And it wasn't until the rebels killed them that they went, holy crap, this is a rebellion. And you can imagine, they're just as upset as, about this as France was because their countries are all run by king and queens, right? So to hear a rebel is killing a king or queen was unheard of. So they went in there and they were trying to put a king and queen back in power. So I think that actually made them act more severely because of the death, maybe. That makes sense. Sure. For the next kings and queens so that we know we're not going to put up with this kind of behavior anymore? Sure. Yeah, I think you all make a great point. Absolutely. Good thinking, you guys. Nice job. All right. So this time period, now that the king and queen are dead, is called the Reign of Terror. And boy, does it earn its title, because it is one of the bloodiest moments in world history. The peasants in Western France, there's revolts everywhere. And it's basically wartime. Because guess what? Finally, like we said, those foreign armies, they finally show up. Now that the king and queen are dead, they are freaking out. So they come and they invade, and their goal is to put that king and queen back in power. Now, obviously, Louis and Marie are dead, but anybody in the royal family, they're trying to just put the system back in place. Because heaven forbid, a rebellion might happen in their country, and they're scared of that. So they're fighting. Well, that's true, yeah. So that it would probably go to another noble family relative, yeah. Yeah, the daughter did live, you're right. So what did they do with the government at this point? The radicals created a committee of public safety. So instead of having a king or a president, they said, we're going to make a committee that makes all the decisions for the country. So imagine everything that our president decides, and imagine five people voting on it every time you make a decision. It would be slow, wouldn't it? And it would be frustrating because you have to vote on everything. That's what they did. Now, in that group, there was a natural leader that kind of rose up from the group, and his name was Robespierre right there, that guy. And they started killing everybody that they wanted to. They killed over 40,000 people for being traitors. And I use that word lightly because anything could be interpreted as that. If they felt you were disagreeing with the government, they killed you. It was just that simple. Um, here are a couple of examples of why it's called the Reign of Terror. The Committee of Public Safety ordered an entire town to be wiped out. The town of Lyon, France, had 1,800 citizens. They believed that these people were not loyal to the government, and so they killed them all. They started by guillotining. The problem with that is you could only kill about 100 people a day on the guillotine, at maximum speed. So that would take 18 days to kill all those people. So then they decided it wasn't fast enough. So they had the team or the town dig a huge ditch. They lined them up alongside the front of the ditch and they brought in some cannons and they shot them all. Pushed the bodies in the ditch, covered them up, and that was the end of lying. Now, if you've not, uh, like maybe you studied this back in the Civil War, but they use what we call grape shot. So instead of a big cannonball, instead you put in all these little balls that are about this big, and they're made of, of pure lead, right? 
It's kind of like the analogy of a rifle versus a shotgun, if you're a hunter, right? How is a shotgun different from a rifle? Okay, powerful. So which one shoots further, a rifle or a shotgun? A rifle does, okay. Um, what does a shotgun do when you shoot it? It explodes. Yeah, it shoots BBs all over, right? It spreads. That's why it doesn't go quite as far, but it can sure do damage, right? Well, this is the same thing, only imagine it on a big human scale. These kind of pieces of lead would tear off arms, legs, half of your face. They were vicious, vicious. We used it a lot in the Civil War. So now in the Civil War, they usually had, what was it, 18 per load, and they would use double which would be like 36 of those flying at you at a time. It was nasty stuff. They also wiped out the entire town of Nantes. Remember the Edict of Nantes? Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. This is that town. They felt they weren't loyal, so they built this huge raft. They brought all the people in the town on the raft, brought it into the middle of a lake, and then pushed them off one by one by gunpoint and held them underwater until every single person drowned. Okay. Nice people. Mm. This is also the group that killed Olympia de Gouge for her women's rights movement. So, what's that? Well, they did. Remember, you've got four groups fighting for control, and so there's bloodshed everywhere. They don't like this government either. Exactly. So it was either you get arrested and get killed, or you fight and you get killed. They really were in trouble, weren't they? It was a mess. It was a mess. They also did what we call a dechristianization campaign, which means, uh, you remember you radicals, you were like, okay, churches are just gonna be worship centers? You didn't go far enough. The real radicals got rid of every church. They basically stole everything of value out of them and they burned them to the ground. No more church, no more worshiping. In fact, they even changed the calendar. So there's no more Christmas, no more Easter, no more Sundays. They got rid of Sundays. They just went from Saturday to Monday. Completely changed the calendar. They wanted no Christian influence on their lives anymore. Now remember, we have these foreign armies coming in and attacking, right? So what they did is they passed a levee en masse, meaning that they drafted soldiers. So instead of volunteer armies, they forced everybody from this age to this age to fight. Basically, while well, my son's, what, 12, he would have been old enough to fight. If you could carry a gun and shoot it, you were fighting. And they had an army that was about one million strong. They really changed things in France from small professional armies like you see in the movie 300, right? To huge armies like what you see in World War II, right? Where we have all these different soldiers fighting. Jackson, did you have a question? I haven't seen exactly how it was drawn up, but I just know that they got rid of Sunday because that was a worship day, you know? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Uh, I suppose Wednesdays were considered a holiday for church, I guess. I don't know. Very weird, though. Yeah. Yeah. And remember, it's because they're fighting those foreign armies. So you can imagine them fighting on every border of France. Well, finally, by the summer of 1794, the French armies were victorious. They pushed all the foreign armies back, so now they were left to fend for themselves. Robespierre and his group continued their executions. It was said that they seized, tried, and guillotined all in the same day. So what does that tell you about their court system? Yeah, they're not very good, and it was very, very fast. What they would do is they would arrest you, bring you into this trial room. He would say, yep, you're guilty, take you out back, and they guillotined you right there. In fact, if you visit Paris, there are certain places, if you have a good tour guide, they can tell you where they executed all these people. Quite often, they'll have a memorial or a fountain where they used to kill all those people. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Now this is where things get a little wonky because Robespierre got a little cocky and the group was tired of getting together and voting on every single thing. So they passed what's called the Law of 22, which gave Robespierre the right to do anything he wanted. They said, you go ahead, we'll just support you. 
Well, what have they just done? Yeah, he's become a king, really, hasn't he? Yeah, he's got absolute power. And um, he obviously used that in a very corrupt way. Started to spout off about how the Congress was corrupt. and He was attacking the Congress. Well, remember, if you say bad things about the government, what do they do? Well, they kill you. So he knows they're coming now. He knows they're coming to arrest him, and he knows the guillotine is coming. So he's sitting at home. He knows they're coming to arrest him. So he picks up a pistol, and he puts it in his mouth. He's going to shoot himself. But at the last second, he moves. And instead, he blows off his jaw, believe it or not, but lives, lives through it. So they arrest him as his jaw is hanging from his face. And then they take him to the guillotine and actually execute him with his jaw hanging off his face. <laughs> so I don't know if this is justice or karma, but he actually dies the way he killed all those thousands of people. He, he died by guillotine. Kind of a weird story. Now at this point, what's that? Well, he could have, yeah, but they must have had at least enough control that they he couldn't quite get to all of them, yeah. Now at this point, Robespierre is dead, and he was basically the leader of the radicals. So now the moderates take over the country. Where's my moderate party? You're in charge now. You're in charge of France, and. Things were still bad, but they weren't quite as bad. They immediately reopened the churches for worship centers, changed the calendar back, and they created a directory, a committee of five to make all the decisions for the country. You notice they didn't learn anything? Did that committee work real well with Robespierre? No, but they didn't learn that a committee doesn't work well leading a whole country. So they made the directory. Now, the directory was not as violent as the first group was. They were a little better about that, but they were corrupt. So I could go to Grace if she's on that committee, and I could say, uh, hey, pass this law, and I'll give you 100 bucks, you know? And they would, because they wanted to, whatever they wanted, they passed. The other problem with this is remember that all these groups that are leading are third estate people. Most of them are uneducated. So no one really knows how to lead the country. They've always had a king that made those decisions. So the starvation is still happening. They have no money. They have no bread. The wars are continuing. People are still fighting and killing each other. So by removing the king and queen, it didn't solve the problem. They have all those problems. Plus, now they're fighting over who's got control. And then in 1799, this guy named Napoleon Bonaparte comes up. He was a military general, and his soldiers were loyal to him over the government. So they followed him, and they enacted a coup d'etat, meaning, of course, the overthrow of the government. And he takes over, and he becomes king of France. Now, this sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? Because isn't that why they rebelled in the first place? Because they had a king and queen? But it's weird. They actually were kind of grateful. Because finally, the bloodshed stopped. They had a leader that had some power and control that could calm things down a little bit. So here's my question to you. And we're going to add some things on the back of your package, just so you know. Okay? So if the French Revolution started by overthrowing a king, and we ended up right back where we started with a king, then why do we study the French Revolution? What do we learn from it? Why do we study it? Write down your ideas. I'll give you one minute to write your ideas, and then we're going to share. Why do we study it if we ended up the way we started? Okay, if you have a birthday in June, July, or August, stand up, please. June, July, or August are summer babies. Awesome. Okay, so why do you think we study this if we ended up the same way we started? Okay, yeah, history is all about learning from our mistakes, hopefully, right? Good, have a seat, nice, Gage. Number of deaths. We definitely study events that kill a lot of people, right? There's no doubt this makes that cut. Excellent, thank you. Why do you think we study this? Or what did they learn from it? Well, I kind of think about the quote that goes, um, if you 
don't learn history and you have a destiny to repeat it. Yeah. And then uh, it's kind of political because people wanted, you know, different things and then women were separated and everything for their different groups. Yeah. We're doomed to repeat it if we don't learn from our history. I love it. Thank you. Good. What do you think? Yeah, it does involve a lot of countries. Um, and it's definitely a first step to see a king and queen being overthrown, especially in Europe. That was really unheard of. Good. Excellent. Why do you think we study this, Haley? Bloodshed? Number of deaths? Okay, good. Yes, we are definitely, and especially starting coming up Monday and Tuesday, we're going to compare this to a lot of different revolutions. Good. Yeah, great, great example. I love it. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I would have to look that up, to be honest with you. I'll see if I can look it up. Okay. Yeah. Oh, absolutely affected millions. Now, what do you think they learned from the revolution that did not work? Oh, the group of five running the country, the committee did not work. Good. What else did they learn? Violence doesn't work. They killed the king and queen and they're still in a mess, right? Good. What else? Yeah, this is the beginning of, of democracy and monarchies that have people's power, right? A republic. Very good. You guys, you're right. This is the first step to the way France is today. Check this out. You ever looked at France's government today? It is directly related to what happened in the French Revolution. Go ahead and draw this on the back of your notes. Now, you'll notice it is like ours in two out of three ways, okay? Okay. First of all, we have our separation of powers. We've got our executive, our legislative, whoops. Our executive, our legislative, and our judicial. Down here, we've got Congress. We've got the National Assembly is what they call it, right? We've got our courts. But here's where you see the effect of the French Revolution. In the executive department, we have two people. Instead of one like we have in our country, they have two. They have a president who serves five-year terms. Now, notice they put in five-year terms, so you don't have like a king that rules as long until they die, right? You can always elect someone new after five years. And they can impeach a president, just like we can. But they also have a prime minister. And notice what their job is. Their job is to represent the majority of the National Assembly or their Congress. His job is to make sure the wants of the people are voiced to the president. They want to make sure that their leader, no matter who it is, knows for sure what you want as a people in France. So they definitely are looking back at that revolution and making sure that doesn't happen. Now, if you look at their checks and balances, you can also see a kind of brilliant idea. Notice who picks the prime minister? The president does. But the president, so the president has control of picking the person. However, they have to be a part of the majority of the National Assembly here. So like, you know, in Congress, how we have Republicans and Democrats, and it goes one way or the other, depending on how many votes they get, right? So let's say there's more Republicans than Democrats this year. Then this person that's the prime minister would be a Republican because it's the majority of the group, okay? But then notice who can fire the prime minister? The assembly, the Congress can. So if this Congress decides that the prime minister is not representing the wants of the people, they can boot him out. And I have seen prime ministers get released in a month because they're not doing their job or they serve a full term depending. So it's really kind of an interesting system. Yeah. So Sure. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if they have a max term. I'm assuming they must because they tend to follow us. I'd have to look that up, but 
um, right. And they keep reelecting them. Yeah. yeah, you know, and we used to allow that, right? Yeah. And then we decided, you know, we didn't want a president in for 20 years. So we kind of limited that, didn't we? Yeah, Kate. Okay. Forgot? Okay, I'll go to her and I'll come back to you. Yeah, Rebecca. I believe, I think they can serve up to five years as well, because they go with the president. So when the new president comes in, then they pick a new prime minister. I believe that's how that works. Yeah. The other side just never completely took power. But that doesn't mean that they didn't fight and they didn't die for their cause. Yeah, it was really kind of interesting. Yeah. Now, look at this. Look at how this system or our system influenced other people. This is the English system. Now, you don't have to write everything down, but I just want you to write down the groups and then write down what their goal was, what their job was, okay? So if I were you, I would create a triangle. Make your triangle, okay? So we've got our judicial, which is just like us, right? They have courts just like us. Now, in the legislative corner, They basically have two groups, which is kind of like us too. We have our House of Representatives and a Senate, right? Well, they have what's called the House of Commons. And notice their job is to represent the people. Then they have the House of Lords. And this is kind of interesting. Their job is to represent the documents of their country. So they look at the English Bill of Rights, the English Constitution, and they look at the law that the people are trying to pass, and they try to figure out, okay, does this go with the goals of our country or not? So they're kind of keeping them honest with their background. Then on the executive side, they have two groups. They have the HM government, And notice it comes from the largest party in commons. So like we said, whichever party is biggest, that would be their representative. And their job is basically just to run the government. Do all the everyday stuff of government. Um, they can put forward laws and stuff like that. And then you have the monarch, the king or queen, right? And notice that they can sign bills into law, but really, they are the figurehead. We've heard that word before, right? Their job is to go kiss babies, shake hands, knight a few people, negotiate with others. They are the face of the country. So they kind of split their power as well. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. And yet you'll see that they can sign bills into law. Just like our president can recommend certain laws, they can do that too. Yep. So just like our national Congress, we have state Congresses in every state that are split like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that goes by counties instead of states. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Because it's about representing the majority, what the people want. So, yeah. Yes, Randa. In France? Well, no, because now we get Napoleon. <laughs> so it's weird. They kind of go backwards for a little while and then they settle. So, like we said, sometimes we take a step forward, but then we step back a few times. Right, to figure it out. Now make sure you guys that you have the name of these systems because you need it for your test. This is a constitutional monarchy. Yeah, yeah, you'll have to label some things on your board questions. So this is a constitutional monarchy. And France is a semi-presidential system.
the great pain. Yeah. Now you don't have to write this one down, but I just wanted you to see how it works. Remember that if we say England, that means just the country of England, right? If I say Great Britain, what does that mean? Yeah, it's all the countries that Great Britain controls, like Scotland, Canada. Did you know that Australia is controlled by Great Britain? Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. So, for example, in, in Canada here, this is a Canada system. Above every govern, government piece in Canada is the monarchy, the British crown. So, technically, the English crown can remove their president, their governors, anybody. In fact, a few years ago in Australia, they tried to remove, I think it was the prime minister of Australia, the people freaked out. And from then on, it's never happened. They like, don't you dare touch our government ever again. And I, I bet you money, when the queen dies in England, Australia will leave. I think they're just there to kind of be polite to the old lady, you know? And when she dies, they'll leave. They will not be controlled by Britain. Even Canada, you don't see Great Britain stepping in a lot in Canada, so, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yep, exactly. Good. Okay.